So the pine cone was founded in 1915. We actually in our office have all of the bound issues back to number one. It was started a year before the city incorporated and obviously it's gone through its evolutions of being sort of the social paper and you could read when Mr. and Mrs. Smith were going on vacation in Tuscany and apparently they didn't worry about burglars back then hitting the homes but under the recent ownership previous to this one they started the police log in 95. It was just the sheriff's calls because that's pretty much all they could get. So when Paul Miller bought the paper in 97, he started actually going to Carmel PD and reading their daily sheets and putting them in the log as well, uh, which I took over in 98. And then, and it was funny, they were all handwritten back then, so I got to know all the cops' handwriting. And then we added Carmel Fire Department's calls a few years ago, probably 2004, and then um, Pacific Grove PD as well. So it's kind of grown over time and it certainly has its fan base. I've had people tell me that they've moved here after reading the police log because they want to live somewhere where the cops will come if there's a raccoon on your roof or you hear a noise. And I've often heard it's the most read thing in the paper, although of course as a newspaper reporter I hope people read the news too. <laughs> there are always people who will come up and talk about their favorite item they've read recently or one they remember. I remember one from the mid-90s about a woman who called the police to report that her little gray cat had been taken and replaced by a little gray cat that was pregnant. I also remember, I remember this one distinctly, it was after I started um, writing the log for the pine cone and there was a woman who called Carmel PD because her dentures had fallen out and they were underneath her bed and she needed them to come and move the bed in order to retrieve them. I heard later, I don't know if it's true, I heard later that she called back angry uh, because they didn't put the bed back in the right spot but I don't know if that's true. There are the calls for definitely raccoons everywhere. There are the calls for disgruntled employees the ones I really don't understand are the people who call and report that they've had some kind of verbal altercation with their teenager. I mean, I thought that happened in every household. I don't know, maybe not, but some people feel compelled to call the sheriff's office. There are the occasional ramblings of the delusional, so you get calls with people who are um, reporting half fish, half humans lurking in their backyards and the FBI clad in black on their rooftops. Um, a lot of people wonder if the real crime is left out of the log, and I would say that definitely if you read it, you know that's not true, but um, I think there's a little bit of a, a thought that this is maybe Shangri-La, and so you get a lot of those, you get the police responding to things that aren't necessarily important. I would say that most often the items reported are dog bites, uh, somebody leaving a trash bin out where it's not supposed to be, paint in the gutter, somebody smells something funny, somebody hears something funny. I mean, where else do you go? And you can call. I live not very far from here, and if I called the cops and said, I heard a noise outside my house, will you come investigate? They would laugh at me. If they would even respond at all, they might just hang up. But in Carmel, they'll actually go and walk around your yard and see if they can find anything that's amiss. Um, open windows, open doors. So it is a lot of that sort of small town stuff. People skipping out on checks at restaurants and driving away without paying for their gasoline and stealing mail out of mailboxes. And I try to leave it as pure as I can because cop speak definitely has its own sound to it. I add prepositions maybe and indefinite and definite articles and a's and the's and things like that because they tend to leave them out. But mostly I try to leave it their voice because I think that's part of what makes it so charming. I have a, a coworker who edits it 
and he likes to make it sound better, and so I'll go in and you know overrule those things a little bit. But um, by and large, it's just compiling the information from all the different agencies and making them read like sentences. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're unintentionally funny, just the way they word things, and so I'll leave them that way, you know, modifier in the wrong place or something like that. But it's, it's fairly pure, actually. I don't play with it very much because it doesn't need to be played with. Carmel does have a law that requires you to have a permit for high heels. Fortunately, you can get the permit from City Hall for free, so it's not too much outlay. I have one because otherwise I'd be wearing illegal shoes. I don't know if it's ever actually been enforced. Um, Carmel, generally a unique place, yes. I mean, there were sort of all those stories about the ice cream ban that Clint Eastwood overturned in 86 when he was mayor. Definitely the police there are tasked with things that maybe most towns don't have to deal with. One of the things is the speed limits. You have speed limits on some of those streets that are 15 miles an hour, which some people can practically run faster than that. And then you have the people who live on the streets who complain about that. You have the people who complain about the other people who have chickens, which are against the law, although now that's changing. You have definitely dog issues, lots of barking dogs. They deal with a lot of barking dogs. There's the animal control officer has run after roosters and geese and rabbits, and but mostly dogs and occasional cats. I get phone calls from people, most often actually, saying, I can't believe you put that item in the newspaper. Everybody knows it was me, even though I don't print names or physical addresses or anything like that. Uh, one of my favorite routine callers is a woman who never leaves her number or her name, and she'll say, the police log was horrible this week. It was so short, and then she'll call some other week when we've had room to run more of it and say, good job on the police log this week. Like, maybe she thinks I make it all up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other things we get a lot of uh, are calls regarding trees and trimming and neighbors sneaking out in the middle of the night to trim trees on other people's properties to improve their views. And I've said on occasion, sometimes been reprimanded for saying it, that in Carmel, dogs are first, trees are second, and people are third. So in, in terms of level of importance. So um, often the police have to go and investigate those things and they send code enforcement from City Hall and if the limb was over a certain diameter and it was trimmed without a permit, you can be fined pretty substantial money. I've heard numbers in the thousands, but I don't know if that's true. Um, but certainly there's a lot of contentiousness because you have people who want more trees, you have people who want fewer trees, you have people who want a lot of trees just not in their yards or in front of their houses. The real estate values are often based on the view. And then you have that population of the city that really holds in high regard the fact it's in a forest. Even though if you look at old photos from the early 1900s, there isn't much of a forest there because the forest is all less than 100 years old, pretty much. Uh, but certainly there have been neighbor spats over that and over fence lines and water use as well. People reporting other people for spraying off their driveways during rationing and watering lawns when in Carmel you're not really supposed to have lawns. And you hear stories about vindictive neighbors coming and turning on the hose bibs and then running away and running up these huge water bills for their out-of-town neighbors who come home to floods and gigantic water bills. So certainly there's water is sort of, wasn't it Mark Twain who said whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over, right? That's certainly true here maybe more than anywhere else. In Carmel, I, I cover City Hall. I cover, as you know, police and fire. I cover schools. I cover sports, I cover food and wine. So I cover a lot of different issues. And within that, you really get a cross section of what Carmel is and isn't. And 
all of the people involved in City Hall who, who are running the city obviously care deeply about it and tap into that philosophy. And so you'll have a planning commission meeting where they will spend an hour talking about whether chickens should be allowed in people's backyards and that you shouldn't have roosters because they make noise. And you want to make sure nobody sees the chicken coop from the street because it might be offensive or the neighbor seeing it out of his back window, he should have a right to appeal the chicken permit. I mean, these are issues that you deal with in Carmel. So you couldn't have live music where alcohol was served until three years ago. They actually had to write a law to allow it. I think the most stunning thing about Carmel, really, and this, I don't know if this will resonate with other people, is walking through it, especially when it's sunny. It's the most beautiful place in the world. And all of the little fine details you see when you are passing by at two and a half miles an hour instead of 20 miles an hour in a car. I mean, the names on the houses, the thought and care that people have put into their gardens. Mind you, of course, the city has a say in what all of your landscaping looks like, but um, the architecture over the years, the little hidden places, the little courtyards. In downtown Carmel, all but two blocks have inner block walkways or little passageways or little courtyards. And so there's always this sense of discovery, even if you've been there your whole life like I have, you're always seeing something new and compelling. And then there's also that real sense of small townness and that you encounter people you know, or you encounter people you think you should know, or you encounter people who think they know you and there's always this warmth and conversation and welcome and I think those are the things that make Carmel really special.